Well, a most holy and blessed Lent to all of you. Um, and welcome to our talk, kind of split in two. My name is Nathan Carr. I'm a headmaster of the academy. My assistant headmaster here, Stephen Taylor. Um, we are, just to give you uh, some sense of our school, we're in Oklahoma City. Uh, we are a school of about 620 students. Um, and, and next year, maybe fast approaching 700. We'll, we'll see if we can find a place for all these little sweet peas. Um, and we are a three campus Christian school of classics, two K 8 feeders into a downtown high school. And we offer both a fully accredited blended model and a fully accredited five day model. So you can choose two day or five day, K through five. You can choose three day or five day, six through eight, and, and then high school is five day only. Um, but I, anyway, that, not, that, that's not necessarily, um, um, ha has anything to do with the talk, uh, uh, but, but just so you can see where, where the, 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 what we propose today, where, where that's taking place, I always find that stuff kind of helpful. I don't know, is there anything else on sort of who we are? <coughs> So fun. Okay. Well, uh, the festive school. Th this is actually the name of a book that I that I've written forthcoming soon from Classical Academic Press. We'll see if I can get through copy editing with Kevin Clark. I mentioned that yesterday. That is uh, that's my mountain to climb right now. I don't like revision. All right. I said what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> I've told a few students along the way like you. Get to age 40, still don't love revision. It's still good. <laughs> but but what a little bit what inspired this book, uh, maybe a lot bit what inspired this book is a little quip from Chesterton in his book Orthodoxy. You know, Orthodoxy, that beautiful gateway drug into mm -hmm. classical and Christian education, <laughs> uh, in which he says, "Joy, which is but the small publicity of the pagan, is the gigantic secret of." Beautiful juxtaposition there. Being oh, you've got the the, the clicker. Do you want, you want it? it? Yeah, I want it Hang on for a minute. Um, and uh, uh, that comment that the church, in fact, is joy, and therefore uh, the the Christian and classical school, which is but an outpost of the city of God, should therefore be governed and managed under the rule of joy. Rule in that sense being something like that of St. Benedict, a way of life, the rule, the way of life. Should be that of joy, and therefore joy should be the most pervasive element of your time um, with students. And in fact, you should lead from a place of joy, which uh, might also be said from a place of the rest that we find um, in the soul certainly the rest that is found in God. That's a little bit of my talk yesterday. Now, a few years ago, um, I, to give some indication that, that maybe this is slowly taking place at the academy, which would be but, for the, but by the grace of God uh, that, that any of that would take place, Tony Eslam is on campus. Um, he's become a friend, and, and certainly you guys have read his works, his... Uh, uh, the first book I read of his was not Ten Ways to Destroy Whatever He Wants to Destroy That Week, but rather his Ironies of Faith, <laughs> but both of which are worth, all of which are worth reading. His Ironies of Faith was just monumental for me. But Anyway, he, he suggests uh, in writing about our school, we had a Dante symposium, that a certain cheerfulness was what he found there because, in fact, uh, and, and this is at, at, uh, because, and, and on the occasion of my teachers, certainly, they had integrated their intellectual and spiritual lives, which, of course, one would have to do that to, to ever experience cheerfulness, much less joy, and, and have that as something that, that in, in fact, could, could flow out into the lives of other people. So I offered that as some sort of, it seems to me that there is a way to lead first with joy, such that those but visiting for a weekend uh, notice it right about it, feel it, experience it, even um, 
and no doubt this is happening in your schools, I, I simply want to encourage it all the more. So, as I said uh, earlier, the church is joy. The school, therefore, must be ruled by joy, and it's joy that most profoundly forms the soul of a child. But the educator may justly ask, how will the church's fire, how will the rule of joy, that Pentecostal fire, uh, manifest itself in assemblies and in tests and in school lunch periods and homework? Uh, I didn't know that we fully answered that question. I will suggest a few ideas today. In fact, we'll try to take that notion even to um, the places of committee work and in leadership uh, here in a minute. That is certainly part of what we want to solve as uh, a leadership at the academy. We have a hundred and <coughs> I have 105 employees going into next year. Um, so, so uh, spread across uh, several zip codes, we serve because of our blended model some 16 different towns and cities. Okay. We have people driving an hour. Often and in huge vans, like watch out for the homeschool van <laughs> coming to a campus near you <laughs> from Shawnee, Oklahoma. I, it's just incredible. <laughs> and and I, would, I, I would suggest to you that uh, I know this is, would be of some, it's not, they're not coming because they're so impressed uh, in the least that Nate Carr has read Joseph Pieper. I, you know, they, they, they really could not care less. I, I'm, I'm guessing. It, rather, they're, they're coming because of a palpable sense of joy. And now that Christian parents feel very much on the defensive culturally, um, I am astonished. Uh, 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 the kind of astonishment that wells up in deep gratitude at, at what these parents are willing to sacrifice and do. And, and put whole worlds aside so that they can drive uh, to these these little parlors of discipleship, uh, what you might otherwise call classrooms. I mean, it's just incredible. So, if the prize of the gospel is the rule of joy made available in the city of God through a marriage of the physical and the spiritual, that's me quoting Eslin there, about our little academy, then a careful understanding of how those realities are made available to us is worthwhile for any educator, right? So the card-carrying ambassadors of the city of God, that's you, Christian educators, Christian um, um, admin administrators become bearers of the very essence of the Christian faith, which is love. And so, of course, love so often overflows as joy, and joy being some, something that is so piercing and so compelling that, that people respond um, very quickly to that. So education becomes, right, mere political antics without a sincere love for God and neighbor which is the very wellspring of any honest attempt at forming the soul of a child. I'm just giving some background before, I mean, this, I promise you most of this talk has rich application, but I mean, you gotta pull some quotes out of your book that's about to come, so anyway. So, 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 uh, briefly, in his wildly unorthodox, that's not a comment on the, his theology, though some might suggest that, but rather on his, the way that he writes a cookbook. She's done a very orthodox cookbook. Um, and rather comical cookbook, The Supper of the Lamb, Robert Cape in France, Humanity's Calling is the Falling. Man's real work is to look at the things of the world, to love them for what they are. That is, after all, what God does. And man was not made in God's image for nothing. The fruits of his attention can be seen in all of the arts, crafts, and sciences. It can cost him time and effort, but it pays handsomely. If an hour can be spent on one onion, think how much regarding it took on the part of that old Russian who looked at onions in church spires long enough to come up with St. Basil's <laughs> Cathedral. Uh, which is to say, the, the reason for that reach um, in the presentation is to say, uh, if love is the governing ethic of your school, um, and your curriculum, as suggested by Capon, is transformed, therefore, by love, then you will begin smelling like this rule of joy that I'm, I'm trying to suggest here. Uh, in fact, your committees uh, and, and uh, your, your financial planning, some of the other stuff that we will soon suggest here, will also begin, even as, as something as, as, as wild and outlandish as, as an onion. This is what's so playful about Capon. You just got to read Capon. Um, 
We'll skip that, and we'll skip that, because we need to move on. Um, you know, email me for the notes, friends. Um, and we'll skip that. So application, let's get to some application for the sake of time. Application for the life of our school, uh, as, under, as, as framed and understood by Joy, comes in several ways in our little our little school. The first, as I suggested yesterday, is an integrative house system uh, through which souls and relationships are networked outside of uh, age group and demographics. Mm -hmm. And putting people and, and things in relationship in the same way that you would in a church setting. <coughs> this is suggested once again that if the, the Christian school is but an outpost of the city of God, then we take our cues but from one place. Uh, and it might not be Dewey. It might, in fact, be the church. And, and the only way that we found to put a total and final checkmate on that system, and obviously I've made peace with that system, I have a third <coughs> way. I do. Uh, the only way that I have found to, to, to put a, a, a checkmate on that system for the sake of joy, and for integrated relationships, was through a health system. Maybe you guys have a better idea. Uh, a better idea. And then to run all of our uh, parent relational networks, even something like a PTA, through what we call a house parent organization. And we can talk about that uh, at length in the Q&A if you wish to hear more. My medics is number two. Again, a, a brief suggestion from yesterday, but my medics comes uh, not only in the plans that you would outlay for a lesson in your, but all of life is my medics. All of life is imitative. And therefore, you, sh you should structure your school uh, and even the rhythms of the day as imitative. And, and, and if you want that imitative rhythm to suggest the life of a preparatory school, that's fine. God bless preparatory schools. But that is something different than, than maybe what uh, the, the kingdom of God might otherwise suggest. I don't know. I, I, and there's ways of... of of carefully and lovingly taking care of both. But just remember, my point is, shy of, of giving every application is to say, remember that even the day itself shapes how students think about the world and how they interact with time. As, as our plenary talk this morning also suggests. The way that you begin a day, and the way that you pass in the hallways, and the way that you mark uh, hours of prayer all suggests to your student how you view the world. Um, so decide and make your peace with how many cues uh, the world will, will provide you and how many cues maybe the church will provide you and how you reach it. Academics, fine arts, the hours of prayer, uh, pilgrimage, the feasts that we catalog both for our patron and patronesses at the school. Um, the liturgical and unhurried wonder of the classroom itself. These are all rich applications for the life of a school that could and should flow out of the suggestion that joy uh, characterizes the school. So with that said, I, I want to move on through uh, other applications and we'll hand off to Stephen. I'm checking my notes here. Okay, ready to go. So I've worked for this guy for eight months. And in those eight months, uh, I've been in many ways his student because you just heard this beautiful, somewhat ethereal, application free vision of festive school leadership. And so uh, I, I have the fun of sharing maybe some of what I've observed. Uh, when, when Nate got his comments back from his manuscript and uh, there was this great book review of, of talking about the elegance and f uh, of his phraseology and uh, the richness of his words. And it was just so amazing. And I'm not sure what he was trying to say. <laughs> uh, is that fair? It, it, was, really fair? it was something <laughs> like that. And so, uh, if, you know, what, what is Nate trying to say when he talks about festive leadership? And I, I've been watching him for eight months, and so there's a little bit of, this is, this is what I've seen over the past eight months. 
Uh, so application for leadership, leading with joy, what does that look like in the boardroom? What does that look like with committees? What does that look like in your administration and your meetings? That's it's all, all content we want to touch on uh, with, with some context, uh, <coughs> if at all possible. I, I think it's fair that if we're going to talk about boards and leading a board, participating on a board with joy, we also have to acknowledge that there are different kinds of boards. And so if I could just suggest three categories, and there's lots of different ways of thinking about this, but there are operational boards or working boards, there are managing boards, and there are policy boards. And there is a time and a place in the life cycle of a school for every single one of these boards. In fact, I, I can jump straight to this whole idea of life cycle. Um, biological life cycle, birth, infant, toddler, adolescent, prime of life, over the hill, old age, golden age, Moved to Florida, <laughs> death. By the way, I did not make up any of this stuff. I copied it shamelessly from other sources. Uh, and, and so you've got this, this growing and aging. And that's, that's the life cycle, right? We teach that in biology. Life cycles also apply to organizations. And if we're going to talk about board leadership, to have some context and understanding of organization life cycle stages and, and how that impacts boards. Mm -hmm. Uh, your working board, your heavily operational board, is very much present in your courtship and infant stage of an organization. That courtship is when a group of people come together and say, hey, is this the worst idea you've ever heard? No, I want to do that too. I've been waiting four years to start a school. And so a group of parents get together and, and they figure out that they're going to start a school. And courtship goes from an idea to a reality. And you've got those early years of, you know, everything is just like, go, 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 go. Like, fly the airplane and build it at the same time. This is a really great idea. Uh, and, and so you go from a working board where the board is very much involved in everything from what are we teaching in our third grade math class to uh, maybe being the secretary at the school to whatever else to, at some point, hiring a, a headmaster or a head of school and delegating more and more of the day-to-day -day decision making. And so as you're going kind of into the go-go or adolescent stage of a, of a life cycle, um, that's when you start to have more of a managing board. And then how many of you have heard of the language of policy boards, sort of governing by policy uh, as opposed to directly managing an employee? Uh, and, and so there tends to be a shift and, and kind of as a organization gets older and older, uh, m there is a, a maturation uh, that goes along with that. Um, it took the academy 11 years to go from uh, uh, kind of the, the courtship to the go-go stage. So some schools kind of do that quickly. Two years, three years, some schools take 10 years. And, and that's okay. But if, but if we're going to talk about boards and kind of the role of boards, I think it's important to have some context to different kinds of, of boards. And we'll come back to this chart with a couple of other comments uh, a, a little bit later on. But you might be asking yourself, where is your school's board? To what extent are they very much in the weeds and in the details working the stuff of the school? To what extent are they primarily managing one person or a, a group of people? And, and by managing, I, I, I do mean some level of giving them uh, daily directives or weekly directives and, and sort of actively structuring what that person's life and leadership looks like and, and to what extent are they really just sort of speaking in terms of broad policies uh, of the direction and protecting the mission and, and moving the mission of the school forward from the 30,000 foot view instead of the 10,000 foot view. Um, so uh, with that as, as a background, um, do's and don'ts of working with the board mm -hmm. and board leadership. <laughs> mm. So I've worked with the board now for some uh, 14 years. Uh, and before I uh, go through the list that is now uh, uh, available to you, we, I've been through sheer trauma with boards. <laughs> I, I, I've had founding families, 
leave uh, in the middle of the school year and it, um, with, with, you know, and I, and I was left holding the bag and, and it being the most um, traumatic experience for the life of a school. I mean, I've had uh, significant uh, sort of second tier donors who've pledged a uh, half a million dollars over several years up and leave in the middle of a, uh, a school year mm -hmm. and had 30 days to close payroll. Um, I had a, uh, uh, a board member pledge uh, the underwriting of a three million dollar build out based on a single bank account and then uh, after he experienced a very shocking and surprising um, uh, uh, bankruptcy within his business group, have all of his assets seized until court proceedings, and we had to find another way to finish building and paying for that building, even because we'd already signed all the, the, the papers for that. So I've had uh, unbelievable pain. I've also had the highest heights of joy, I would very much say, the last two years. I've had moments with boards where we've had to uh, increase tuition by 25% in a single year because of a, a, a miss uh, in pricing from uh, uh, anyway, a former colleague who had, um, anyway, right, you only have three, you got your, uh, you got your price per unit and number of units sold and we had a, 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 you know, a finance committee miss a little bit of, uh, um, uh, of that and had to recalibrate in, in a significant way. Uh, that being the case, I really do delight in working with boards. And we've made it through. There's hope for you. 14 years later, we're still around. You know, we're, it's a huge school now. So God's grace is there uh, in, in those dark nights of the soul with your board. But... Um, I have, the, and some of this, by the way, is aspirational um, to the degree that you can uh, slowly swim upstream of dwelling in the minutia with your board. You give them a good gift and you give the school a, good, a, a very, very, very good gift. And you will have board members along the way that think to some degree that um, and, and because maybe they themselves are detail oriented that think the best way and the most healthy thing for the school is for them to live there. But I think uh, that will, in fact, handicap um, the life of the school over time. And God's grace is available, of course, in operational boards, particularly at the beginning. I, I would never have been able to achieve liftoff without that. But then you need to quickly spin that, and that's not a surprise to any of you. So long as you are dwelling in the minutia, you will have five-hour meetings every month. And you'll walk out, I mean, they're just mind-numbing uh, meetings. Uh, there, there's a reason, right, that ACCS, I think, averages uh, uh, three years for heads of school uh, before burnout and transition. I think the average is two and a half to three years. Um, and I believe, I, it, 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 I think there's a, uh, there are no doubt numerous reasons. But at least one of those reasons must be um, this, uh, this comprehensive and bewildering um, li life of boards that never quite pulls out of minutia. And it's just exhausting because you end up managing the expectation. You have 10 bosses and you're managing 10 five hour opinions uh, as, as dictating much of your time, rather than some of the other things that we'll suggest later. That in the presentation. And then certainly you'll, you'll battle to some degree uh, founder's syndrome, um, which is, you know, it's what my wife and I are about to experience as our sophomore moves out of the home. My, my daughter's gonna have to live through founder's syndrome. My oldest of six is going to fly the coop and I'm obsessed with her and I don't want it to end. And so she will have to teach me to some degree to back off as she spreads uh, and she will not come back. She's a little independent thing. Um, so she, to some degree, you, you can, um, I, I have experienced a founder's syndrome, but this, this notion that um, 
those who, who, who founded the school, those who've invested the angel investment, um, will always have the best and brightest opinions for the life of the school and for the future thereafter, rather than letting uh, trust and, mm -hmm. and other people come around and say, that's a tough place to be. I know that some of you were there. Some of the do's, because I need to hurry up, is to move what I say to my board, um, nose in, hands out is the goal. They need to keep a sense of the aroma, uh, absolutely. I don't want to run a school alone. Uh, I have lunch with a board member oftentimes every week, one of my 10 board members. I would encourage you to do that, administrators. Nose in, hands out. If I'm doing that, it, I'm just cutting away how much I have to talk about at the board meeting these beautiful lunches. And they're, they're, they're deeply encouraging. They're spiritually encouraging to do so. And then I go everywhere with my entire, entire leadership team as well. I'm never alone, even my board meetings. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay. Mm. Strategically profiling who you want on your board. Uh, there's a lot to say there. And making use of committees to keep meetings short. I'm obsessed with committee work and will suggest how you can carve that up put detail-oriented board members on those committees and get rich, rich, rich work. And how to let go as an administrator as well. So that you, uh, not every conversation absent you um, <laughs> is an attack on your leadership. Mm -hmm. you, you gotta get over that. Um, so I, I wasn't there for that one. Big deal. Um, you've got to trust your people. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. But. Feeling that pace, buddy. Ready to go. What's up? What's next? If you've got a five hour board meeting, there are committees that you need to offload three of those hours to. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, at, at our school, those committees include a finance committee, fundraising committee, a building and land committee, a governance committee, uh, which is really about uh, the board itself and maintaining the life of the board well. We have Brandcom, Branding and Communications. It's something that we value. An ed team, education team. Uh, there's also a curriculum committee, which is a subcommittee of the ed team. There is an athletics committee, a fine arts committee, and the head support and evaluation committee. These all standing committees? Uh, they all exist <coughs> at the moment. I think that they all have uh, some of them are definitely permanent, and probably not all of them are permanent. Most of those, in fact, are in our, maybe even in our bylaws. I'm trying to uh, think of it, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, last yeah. I would say that uh, the only one here that is not currently a highly active committee it would be Fine Arts. Uh, and so I think there's, with some committees, an ebb and a flow in a season. Uh, ed team has a, a highly active role, and the curriculum committee, that's a subcommittee, which includes people who aren't on ed team, right? The, 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 this, every committee has a board member on it, so that there is that sense of ownership and, and buy-in to what the committees are doing. Uh, but they also include non-employees, and so figuring out which employees, uh, which boards uh, uh, are the right person, sorry, which board members are the right person for a committee, and then also which parents or other community reps are the right person, uh, can have a teacher. Our branding and communications committee has multiple teachers and parents. Uh, one of them is a graphic designer, right? We want that graphic designer on our branding and communications committee. Uh, so these are... Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, at what, in, in, the, in the development of your size, at what point, you know, because like when you're really small, you end up with like you know, the same 10 people who are willing to give time, then, you know, you end up with really, you know, a weird setup for committees. Or we only have five board members, you know, and so we couldn't even possibly do it unless they all, you know, right. doubled up. But kind of what do you see is like as it develops, you know, when that naturally fits in that life cycle that you're talking about, as you, because this is obviously your size, you know, you've got the people to plug in those spots. Um, and yeah, I mean, you have thoughts on how that kind of looked as you developed, or? Well, I, I would say the, 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 maybe this is an answer to your question. The committees most active in the early years were these four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Finance, fundraising, governance, and ed team. Mm -hmm. Self-perpetuation of governance, of course. And headmasters sat all four. I no longer sit all committees, yeah. nor, nor should I. Sure. I, you know, 
we don't need a personality cult. Do you think you needed to at first? Um, or do you think you just did it out of a sense of responsibility? At first, because I had no other administrators. Okay. I mean, right. that's how small I started with 26. Right. Go team. <laughs> you know, 700, right? That um, I, just because I was the only one integrating all the information, presenting it back to the board. Right. And, and then I, I felt uh, the board having, yes, even today, still but one employee. But to the degree I could become more and more and more um, surrounded and therefore accountable to others and what I say and what I, I started bringing as many people to board meetings personally as I could for yeah. my leadership team. But in the beginning, yeah, I sat on But still kept the time short. That's the, the part that to me seems like a miracle. No, <laughs> no. The beginning, it was five hour meetings okay. destroying me. This yeah. is me editing backwards and saying, it took committees for me to finally mm. farm that yeah. out. Yeah. And even in short form, even though there were only four committees and I started looking for a board member on each, at least we got to three and a half hours. Sure. Round one, right? right? And it's now, it's easily done in less than two hours once a month. Great. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah? I don't know if you intend on doing this, but I think it'd be worth momentarily spelling out HSEC, which is the importance of that for this group, I think. HSEC is my head of school support committee. Uh, there are two board members who meet with me monthly mm -hmm. and check in on. I, you know, largely what are discretionary topics, confidential pressures, and things that need, uh, you know, I just need to vent or to unload or offload and just get rich spiritual counsel. Uh, all things are safe in that environment. There are things personal to my family. There are things uh, that are high risk maybe to the school, but I don't want, I don't want anybody to panic yet, but I still need... So these are rich, 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 rich spiritual friendships that still address uh, um, school issues, if need be. But I can also share in that moment, like, you know, I mean, last year my second born had open heart surgery. My head of school support committee was, for three months, just bringing meals and ministering to me. They, it was the same committee a year before, uh, the year you know, 18 months previous, that helped me roll out a 25% tuition increase mm -hmm. and helped me not go crazy as I had my face pounded, right? So, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're very, it's an incredibly good and precious thing. And my leadership team also serves a little bit of that role. Uh, they're, they're ministers to me, each one in their own way. So with these committees, oh, go ahead. I'm just curious, uh, looking at the life cycle of the school, you know, you're in the the courtship through the go-go model, right? <laughs> Head of school is, is running into themselves because they're there so much and they're involved so much that you're literally running into yourself at the door. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you manage that transition when you have a governing board that is very involved still by necessity because you're in a new school, right? So that's part of the life cycle. We know that's part of the season. And yet, you're needing to create those committees in which those same board members are going to likely be your chairman of those committees, who are also still your boss. So how do you delineate and, and, and create those, what's some good language to use to create those lanes where in this identity, I'm the head of school, you're my government, member of my governing board, and we have this relationship. But in this very same moment, I am the head of school, and you are my committee chairman reporting to me for me to make a decision to you as governor. What were some of the languages yeah. you used to keep that healthy? Oh, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> the first, well, my, my first comment, lest I fail to make it, and riffing is, I don't, it is not ever guaranteed or even obvious that the board member will be the chairman of the committee. Ever. Um, if their talent, gifting, and calling for that particular season and the need in that committee matches, that's a great day. So, chairman is a board member, chairman is not a board member, chairman is not a board member, chairman is a board member, chairman is not a board member, chairman is not a board member, chairman is a board member, chairman is not a board member, chairman is not a board member. Um, though each has a board member present. So I would say lead with that, 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 that 
the discernment of a chair involves a committee um, must, you, you know, the, the first uh, consideration of cha cha chairman, chairwoman it does not have to be first, does the board member want it or not, and then if they don't, we'll go looking for somebody else. Right. Um, so anyway, that would be the first thing. As far as transitioning, transitionary language, what I did was I, I I figured out on my board who would be um, the most helpful vocalizer on behalf of the head of school, headmaster, and said, met with him and said, I need your help um, so that it comes from a peer board member in telling this board that in fact uh, the operational board has run its course and it's mm -hmm. time to move on. Will you help me achieve a committee structure and I'll write an abstract or a draft of what I think each committee would do. So he became my advocate mm -hmm. uh, to the other board members. It was helpful that he, in fact, had been, uh, had lived many, many years in corporate structures where he saw committee work happening in rich ways, you know, for a 25 year career and saying, I know exactly what you need. I got you. Okay. And helped, mm -hmm. you know. In particular, some of my founding mamas say, "Okay, it's going to be good. This is this is great." And another another piece of that transition, uh, and this is um, this was a complete shock to me when I started working for Nate. Nate does the first half hour of the board meeting, and then he's like, "I'm done, Stephen. What do you have to say?" Uh, and, and so that radical sharing of leadership, you know, that you it doesn't have to be a one man show. It doesn't have to be one person trying to field every angle of every component, you know, get your committee chairs to come. Uh, and maybe those are board members, in which case you've got four board members who are each taking a turn leading their chunk of the meeting. Uh, set a, you know, set a, a timetable and, and set a timer. You know, if, if, you know, how are we going to move from five hours to three and a half hours? Or we're going to set timers. Uh, and, and, you know, I think there's, I think there are some tools that you can do to, uh, move the needle, and that's what it is. It's a slow moving of the needle. But let's uh, let's keep pushing through. A couple of other do's and don'ts. I, mean, I think we've already kind of empowered some of these. Is there anything else you want to pull out? Nope. I think we covered all that, more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just and again to my fellow administrators, just as you transition from being the one guy, kind of do it all. Do not feel, uh, uh, don't, don't be reluctant to release. Don't feel that that's an encroachment on your leadership as, as people buy in and want to help you lead. Uh, fear and greed are poor motivators in the end to maintain control. And love can overwhelmingly conquer that, even when a committee brings something to you that's going very, very, very wrong. Uh, love can still win, win the day. Uh, the, the, bring that to ready go meeting culture uh, this was one of the things I I am guilty of sometimes leading meetings with a posture of uh, okay we got a lot to get through we're gonna slog through this uh, and, and so uh, radical hospitality and meetings squirrel $500 away in your budget for the coffee for the croissants for the fancy cookies at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, have more meetings in coffee shops than you do in your office. Have more meetings outside of the school than inside of the school. Uh, think about what it means to have every meeting have an element of fun, uh, frivolous seriousness, as it were. Uh, and, and even the, the reminder to yourself, oh my goodness, <laughs> we have a school. It's like it's a real thing. Uh, and, and these cues, and if you as the leader are setting the tone of joy, everyone else will enjoy being there with you, even while you're trying to figure out how to solve this $50,000 deficit. Uh, it's so critical to bring that posture and, and spirit of, we're all in this together. Thank you for helping me. Let's have a party at the same time. Absolutely. I uh, I don't want to get worn out, friends. Um, 
So if you can keep, if I haven't, I have not been in my office in two weeks. Uh, it's basically a museum. Uh, it's basically a library, which I. You must be so very active and um, have a rich dynamic. I think there's a way to keep that festive joy a part of all that you do, and to remain light-hearted. Um, I, I think that creation itself. Right is suggestive. Just looking out this window, that um, mm -hmm. utility is not the full story. I, my guess is that the, the uh, right that observation, contemplation, um, it's sort of it, 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 creation itself bears witness to the fact that the joke is on the world, uh, insofar as you're sweating. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at this beautiful uh, scape in front of me. So let uh, while, while the world certainly uh, labors on in its um, exhausted way, it's, it's just good to remember that from creation forward, it is suggested all around us that there's a lightheartedness uh, and the life of the contemplative that can inform your needs. So just don't sweat it. Okay. Renee, what's an odium liberalis? This is a pause that we have at the beginning of every meeting to reflect on something read. Uh, so more often than not with me, it's poetry. I, I just, uh, poetry seems to be the last um, thing to conquer with so many. Uh, so I just try to bring it right up front and, and read it publicly. So, We'll, we'll take a finance committee meeting and um, uh, annoy the heck out of everybody with a six-minute pause. And, you know, seven years later, they, they get into the rhythm, right? If everything is mimetics, then your meetings and the way that you detail a meeting is suggestive of your view of the world. So if you just jump right into uh, the payroll issue, then you are suggesting that, uh, uh, right, that, that the pain of the world uh, can overcome the life of delight or something. And, you know, just you have to re-script committee life to even match what you believe to be true of the gospel itself. In some way. I'm not saying odium morale is the only way to do that at all. It's, it's a way that we just cause pause every time. Like, yeah. Golly, that $350,000 deficit is the worst. We should read a poem. Mm -hmm. I, know what, I, I know what an $850,000 annual deficit feels like. Um, where you're spending prepaids to bail out of a, a really uh, you know, poor, poorly considered um, past that I've now inherited right, as, a, as a headmaster. We didn't give up odium liberalis in those moments of heated discussion with my board. You still got to read poetry. Um, to right, right now our board is reading uh, a Doug Wilson book, chapter two each meeting. Right now our yeah. operations team is reading Death by Meeting. Patrick Lencioni mm -hmm. talks about meeting structures and when to have them and how to have them and how to have a, a spirit of fun. In some ways, uh, I don't actually think that Nate has read any of Patrick Lencioni's books, uh, but he embodies the Christian version of Patrick Lencioni's leadership style, uh, or, or at least the Episcopal priest version. Uh, okay, we're going to keep keep pressing pressing forward. Any specific books that you would recommend with the board? I've never read a book on board leadership. Um, I hate to admit, but I have a rich relationship with them. I don't know. Do you have any? Death by Meaning's got to be one of the best, right? I don't. I haven't read it, but surely it's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Get your administrators to read Death by Meeting, especially if you have a culture of. We have another meeting. You know, his whole premise is that meetings is actually where the stuff happens. Uh, it, and, and that's where the collaboration and that's where the work comes to fruition. And so uh, the problem with a meeting is 
uh, that you did the wrong thing in that meeting mm -hmm. and you confused your five minute meeting with your two hour meeting. And so uh, have a daily five minute meeting by all means. Make sure you have the right content in it. Mm -hmm. Stand up, don't sit down. Uh, have your weekly meetings, you know, in the same way that a five minute commercial and a an, uh, TV show for 45 minutes and a two hour movie and a 30 hour TV series, C TV series all have a different pulse of content. Mm -hmm. Your meetings should have a different pulse of content as well. So have a leadership retreat where once a year you go off for four days and do something totally different. Even if you have to uh, stay at someone's um, chateau. Chateau. Well, that's the ideal. Uh, we, we go to Colorado for our leadership retreat, but it wasn't always that way. It used to be a hotel down the street, right? You know, give yourself. Uh, an opportunity to plan well uh, and, and there's a lot of good resources and so think about what you're struggling with and then go Google uh, what are books about this topic and, and introduce that and, and read read Hopkins poetry too. Uh, bring it bring it all together. Um, we're gonna skip some of these slides uh, although this is kind of a, a fun one just thinking about the roles of, of, of an organization you want people who are kind of driving, producing results, uh, especially at the very beginning when you've got uh, that courtship infant kind of launching stage, like that's what matters. Like did we get students here and did we teach them so that they come back next year? Uh, the, the, the administration doesn't really come in until you're maturing a little bit more. The entrepreneurial is very much front loaded. You need someone who's producing ideas a mile a minute. Uh, and then the, the integrative kind of the, the glue, you know, who are the people who serve the role of connecting everyone and, and, and creating the relational glue that holds an organization together. And uh, one person doesn't do all four of these. So how are you stacking your leadership team with these different capacities? Um, and, and even it's kind of going back to that life cycle of an organization. The very beginning, it's that entrepreneurial role that takes front and center. Like someone came and said, hey, let's do this crazy thing. Let's have fun with this. And then you very quickly get into this world of producing results. Like we have to have students here and we need to have them come in the school and we better have a process for doing that. Uh, and then as you are maturing and growing, you start having a little bit more of needing uh, ongoing entrepreneurial to meet administration uh, and, and meet systems and processes. There's this tension that uh, I'd like to think that Nate and I represent well in terms of entrepreneurial delight and joy and systems and thinking in terms of categories and processes. Uh, and, and you have to have both of those eventually. You don't necessarily start there. But the definition of inefficiency is recreating the wheel every single time, right? So if, if you don't have any sort of processes, then you're constantly finding yourself figuring out what did we do last year? Where's the playbook? I didn't I have someone write your playbook for that event that you do every single year. You don't have to constantly recreate it. And it takes a systems thinker to create the playbook and to, to design it well and write it down with enough direction and detail that someone else can pick it up so that when, when Joey leaves and moves to Texas or wherever, Colorado, uh, that his whole information download goes out the door with him? No, that's terrible, right? Make sure that you've created some of these systems so some of these things have a life past. All right, we'll keep going on. Uh, by the way, this is kind of fun. Um, again, thinking about that life cycle of an organization, an aging organization is when your administration is now taking preeminence over everything else. Uh, you don't have the entrepreneurial spirit, it's administration and who knows who. The networking, the integrating, you know, it's kind of the, 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 the old boys club, if you will, right? The, the aristocracy. Uh, and, and then it, it starts to go downhill from there. Uh, the guy who, who's um, this Stephen Gibbs, I think, is the name of the guy who put this together and who I borrowed it from. Um, his, his thesis is that by the time you get to here, it's almost impossible to pull out. You're in the decline. Mm -hmm. From here, from aristocracy, you can have a reshuffling and think, how do we reinvent ourselves? How do we kind of get back into the, the lifeblood of, of a growing organization? Um, so anyway, there you go. 
Can I ask another question? Sorry, I know we're running out of time. Is that okay? Yeah, go right in. Oh, damn it, you can tell me no. No. So a lot of this to me assumes that like you have a, it seems like mostly administrator, headmaster, right? Initiated in a lot of ways. Like you're talking about the things you know that you've done. Um, and you have an incredible amount of equity with your board, I would assume, right? Longevity and success. And, and, and so, but like in our position, it was, you know, I came in a position, or been in a year now, where it was a previous leader who um, did, it needed to be more board initiated, right? A lot of things. And so, is that just the transition, you know, into like, you know, managing into policy or that? Or because it, it just seems like to me, I'm, I'm struggling to see. So how do I apply this stuff when I'm not the driving force in the board meetings, right? I'm not the person that calls the meetings, assess the agenda, and those kinds of things. It's never been how ours has operated. Interesting, right? And so is what you know. And so is what you're talking about. The policy change is that thing where you have to say, well, the headmaster has to. You know, and you've always been the visionary at your school as well, right? right. And so that's a really different when you step in into a thing and then become a new driving force, but there's all these inherited systems, which is, you know, on this curve, cl getting close to recrimination like when I took over, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then figure out how do we yeah. reinvent ourselves, start a new bell curve, right, and all that. Does that make sense? Is a it makes perfect sense. And it's not unlike my uh, entry into my current church, mm -hmm. which has an 88-year history, yeah. only four of which include me. Uh, so I understand the position. Here's the existing vestry. Here we go. Uh, but but I so but but to I want to make sure I understand the question. Your question is how uh, how do I gain more of over time the yeah I'll, I'll just let me, control let me to achieve this. Okay, because yeah, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. robust. That's why staff tells me that. <laughs> um, this presumes a, a, an incredible amount of headmaster influence over the process. Oh, absolutely. When you don't have that. Oh my God. So, so I think one answer is who's cycling onto your board. You know, there, there are certain things. Well, I don't even have any influence over who does or doesn't cycle onto my board. But I think there's an opportunity to have a conversation so, yeah. with the guy who does, right. who's setting the agenda of, hey, you know, get, get him to buy into the idea that you're trying to come up with a little bit of, of entrepreneurial energy. Mm -hmm. Can we, are there any entrepreneurs in our community right. who we think, you know, think in terms of some of those roles of, right. of who you can have bring in. Mm -hmm. Uh, a different perspective and, and posture. Yeah. Uh, can I add some insight just from, from past experience? I've been in those situations where you you roll into a, situ a situation where your organization is darn well close to recrimination and completely <coughs> eaten up with bureaucracy, and you're having to change something else. And one of the things that might work, or is maybe worth considering, is to take yourself back as the head of school, to a posture of courtship, to a posture of winning the board by introducing the board, you know, I hate to say it this way, but almost treating the board as, as the love that you are trying to win, and, and recognizing that building that relationship and that trust has to occur before you can, you can start to exert influence. And so you have to give yourself the time just as you would give your time in, in courting your, your love, you would give it the time to develop. So the strategy becomes introducing the book, introducing the idea, introducing the commentary, um, and letting it start to rebuild itself with you very quietly leading, not in those main areas, but in those areas of the idea of getting there. Is that, is that an appropriate strategy, do you think? And maybe, maybe one other answer to that same question that's on our, our last slide here, and then we'll let you guys go. Uh, creating administrivia instead of conquering new worlds. Oh, man, that is my whole life's mission. I, anyway, I, I, I feel like to keep a, a certain dynamic uh, at a school that's always compelling, you need to always be focused on new worlds to conquer because it just keeps this purity to the whole enterprise of, so. And administrivia, man, there's a lot of people that uh, trying to figure out what they should do all day every day are great at creating, um, uh, doubling the size of their policy manual. You just need to be careful about that. Pick your Moses, be careful, so. Um, 
Anyway, the rest is, uh, I probably, fairly self-evident. Um, I also would suggest to all of you that thinking, another thing that's going to gain you credibility as an administrator, um, like love or hate it, is if you become to some degree successful or a part of the, the life of development, financial development of your school. And so leaving that to somebody else will always leave um, the, um, the purse strings that you hope to administer to someone else as far as how that purse is filled up, which will leave you without a, a, something of a string that you probably otherwise would want to be holding. So I threw myself as an untrained development person into uh, cultivating a rich network of givers, and, and millions of dollars later, it's gone really uh, well, and I, I don't know a thing about it. So how, I, I realized that, that, that may be something a little more um, obvious to my personality, and maybe it's not yours, but don't think for a minute that is somebody else's job, or you'll find yourself in service, uh, 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 your influence will, will take a hit because someone else is, is getting your money for you. Just participate to some degree, uh, even if it's for your, per, you know, like your, your, your hard wiring setting up the tables. Um, and if it's your chairman of the board who does that, uh, ask to go along. Ask him to invite you into that relational uh, you know, to participate at the relational level, and, and you got to start somewhere. You got to take it one step at a time. Yeah. Other questions? I work, we're at time. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, I want to talk to you. Question about your policy. So I can okay. talk to you. God bless you guys. Thank you.